If that's all right. So uh, welcome to the Observatory webinar. Uh, my name's Charles Lane and I'm sat in York on the end of a telephone. Uh, I'll let my colleagues in Alice Holt introduce themselves just before the presentation, if that's all right. I thought it might be just nice to uh, share a few reflections. So we've recently had the, uh, the EPO Tree Health and Plant Health Early Warning System Conference at Kew in February, which was a huge success. Lots of good volunteer participation, some really good presentations from the team, loads of really good feedback from all sorts of people about how good observatories been. So that's a really nice one for the volunteers, so well done folk. And then yesterday we had the annual audit from the EU because the EU are funding this project yeah. and we have an annual audit and they were really positive. The guy who was our auditor uh, says he has about 30 projects and his, in his, his experience this is the project he likes the most mainly because of the strength of the partnerships and uh, what we've been able to achieve so quickly. So again, really good feedback from those sort of folk. So I'm going to hand over to the Alice Holt crew who are going to talk about pine processionary moth, go through the presentation and then we'll take questions at the end about this presentation in specific or in any general questions if that's okay. So down to Alice Holt. Hello, so here in the office we've got me, Susie, um, Anna Perez, and we've got Christine Kilbury today, who's an entomologist, so it would be really good if you've got any sort of questions about um, pine processionary moths or, or any other insects, I'm sure Christine will be very pleased to answer them for you. So I'm just going to say well, welcome to the webinar, and, um, and we're covering the pine processionary moth, which is a destructive insect that attacks pine trees. So here on the right hand side we have an adult pine processionary moth. So they look very similar to the oak processionary moth with their cream forewings and brown markings. And because they are fairly indistinctive looking, they can be difficult to tell apart from other moths. And here on the left hand side you can see the larva or the caterpillars, uh, which are hairy and coloured orange brown with blue bands. And this is the stage that causes all the damage and like its close relatives, the oak processionary moth, the larva move around in nose to tail processions. So the host trees are pine trees. And of course we have extensive plantings of pine in this country because pine is an important forestry tree for us here. So we mainly have Scots, Lodgepole and Corsican pine. But there are other recorded hosts for the um, pine processionary moth as well, such as the Atlas cedar and also the European larch. So how does this insect actually affect the pine trees and what does it actually do to them? Well, it causes damage to the needles of pine trees as it feeds on them and in large numbers um, they can severely defoliate the trees, weakening them and making them more susceptible to attack by other pests or diseases. Um, and also to environmental stress caused by drought or flooding. And so with pine being a commercial species, this would affect the productivity of the tree in terms of timber production, and this would also have a knock-on economic effect too. And that's why we don't want them here. So these caterpillars attack our trees, but they're also not good for us either. And like um, the oak processionary moth, the pine procession moth caterpillars re represent a public health hazard because they're covered with hairs which contain an irritant protein called tamatopoin. So if we come into contact with these hairs, then we may, may end up with painful skin irritations and rashes and in some case allergic reactions too. So these hairs can be released by the caterpillar as a defense response and then be blown around by the wind into contact with people and animals. So you can actually suffer these skin disorders even if you don't come into direct contact with the caterpillars themselves. So if you do see these caterpillars, please don't touch them or approach them and instead just report them to us through tree alerts. So the pine processionary moth is native to and until recently was only found in the, the Mediterranean region, North Africa and some areas of the Middle East and Southern Europe. So it's not here yet, but it has been extending its range across Europe towards the English Channel, and it's definitely heading our way. And although the pest is not actually established in the UK, um, it has been found here in the past. So we know that the pathways do exist for it to get here. 
Because in the past, we've had one transient population of larva um, in a UK nursery in 1995. And we also, um, an adult moth was also trapped as well in Berkshire. So um, although they're not here at the moment, they, um, they have been here in the past. So this slide shows the life cycle of the pine processionary moth, with the adults emerging and flying in the summer. So the adults only live for about one day, and during this time they mate and lay eggs as egg masses in pine trees. So the larvae hatch in the autumn from the eggs laid in the summer and begin feeding on the trees' needles in the autumn. And then in the January, they build tent-like tent nests. So the caterpillars overwinter in these nests high up in the pine trees and they form processions on the ground in the early spring before pupating in the soil until late summer when they emerge as adult moths. So what are the main signs and symptoms of this moth? Well the main ones are processing caterpillars, damage to the needles caused by the larva feeding and also the presence of nests in the pine trees. The easiest stage of the life cycle to recognise is the caterpillar, especially as they, as they move around in these nose to tail processions. And the most likely time you'd see them would be as they are processing on the ground in the winter months and early spring. So this slide here um, shows another of the main signs and symptoms of pine processionary moth attack. And this discoloration and defoliation of the needles, which you can see here, results from the caterpillar's feeding. So the extent of damage and defoliation depends on how heavy the infestation is, with high levels of infestation resulting in complete defoliation of the tree. So another major sign of the moth, and, some, and something that we can look out for, are these nests that um, the caterpillars construct high up in the pine trees. So you can see that they are white and silken and tent-like, and they are built around January time, and the caterpillars actually overwinter inside them, and they can get to the size of a football. So here on the left-hand side, you can see a fairly, a fairly fresh nest. So it's very white and very clean-looking and easy to see. Um, and there can also be several nests in one tree, and you can see that here on the right-hand side. And also, um, you can see sort of severe feeding damage on that photo too. Here you can see another one of these nests. This time, the caterpillars are actually present and crawling around on the outside of the nest. So the caterpillars tend to spend their days inside the nests, usually only venturing out at night to forage on the needles. Here we have an example of a very early nest, so small and not yet white, where you can just about see the white webbing just beginning to build up. And you can see here on the right, where the arrow is pointing, this browning on the needles, and this is caused by the caterpillar's feeding. So here we have two more fresh nests in the same tree, again looking very white and very conspicuous, and of course this, these will be the main indicator of the presence of the pest. So over time, these nests become damaged and discoloured, and you can see a nest here that has become sort of very degraded. So you can see they look very different from when they're first made. And here is a very old nest, and you, um, it's almost unrecognisable. Um, you can see that all the white silken webbing has now disappeared, and again, it looks completely different from when it was first constructed. So um, various fungal diseases, such as cyclonusma and lophodomela, can also cause discoloration of the needles, similar to that caused by the pine processionary moth. So they can cause a browning and yellowing, and they can also cause defoliation of the needles too. Um, and there's also other insects, such as the leafwood beetle, the ermine moth, and the pine hawk moth larva, can also feed on pine needles as well. So this slide is really just to illustrate that um, there are other organisms, pathogens, and insects that can cause similar symptoms on pine. So just because you see sort of um, some symptoms on pine 
it's not necessarily the prime processionary moth, and you have to look for all of the symptoms. And this is the last slide, and just mentions a few biosecurity issues. So first of all, we think that the main pathway for entry to the UK um, for the pine, process pine processionary moth would be in the soil of live plants, because they do pupate in the soil, and so these pupae can be hidden in the soil around the roots of potted trees. And to minimise the risk of spreading the disease, we need to follow high-risk biosecurity measures at all times, um, and taking particular care not to remove any tree debris or material from the site because egg masses and or caterpillars may be present, especially in the early larval stages when they are small and difficult to see. So all through the summer and through to the early winter, you have to be very, very careful. And um, we need to make sure that we don't remove any soil from the site as this might harbour pupae. Okay, so that's it for the pine procession we more. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you do have any questions, we have Christine Silvery here, an entomolo entomologist. So any questions on um, the pine procession we moth or any other pests, she'd be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you. All right, so when's the best time to look for it? It's not sort of the safest time. Um, I don't... I don't think there, there's a, a safest time. The, the main symptom that you would be most, the most obvious symptom would be the white nests. Right. Uh, they begin to form, uh, the larvae will begin to form those really as soon as, um, as, soon as they hatch, um, which would be in um, early autumn. But the right. very... They're very, very fine and diaphanous in the early stages, and it's not until about the fourth um, stage of the larvae um, that you get these definitive winter nests um, for right. them. These are these really obvious white um, bag-like nests. So really, um, those, you know, that that's the main thing. And and if you see nests coupled with defoliation symptoms. Mm -hmm. then um, you, you know, there's a potential problem there. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just sort of worried about, you know, the actual caterpillars and the allergic reactions and things. I've got a lot of allergies, oh, my God, you know, yeah. Right. So, yeah, the, the caterpillars, I mean, they spend most of their time um, up in the tree. They only come down to the ground when they're fully grown. Um, right. And, and they, they then process down the trunk of the tree and pupate in the soil, and it's mm -hmm. that um, that's when they come. So the only time really, unless you get heavy rain and they get washed out of the tree, mm -hmm. but otherwise they they tend to be up in the trees. Right, so and that would be this time of year when they're doing the processing, then, wouldn't it? I suppose early spring. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. And um, it very much depends on the weather as to how far they'll go. If it's very hot. They tend to not travel very far, and they'll be right. close to the tree in the shade. But mm -hmm. if it's cooler, um, they will um, they will travel further away from the trees to to choose a suitable pupation site. Right. And they can go, you know, up to sort of 30 or 40 meters from the yeah. from yeah. their uh, host tree. Right. And where's the best sort of place to look for it in terms of? Um, Pine trees. Would it be sort of in woodland, or would it, could it affect like pine trees that just sort of grow, you know, in isolation on the side, well, not the side of the road particularly, but you know, sometimes it's just like lone trees. Well, lone trees are um, particularly attractive to the moths. Um, are they I think, right? I think they um, they pick they pick out the silhouettes of the trees. I think when they're mm. they're selecting nesting sites, so isolated trees and pines on the edges. Um, yeah. of plant plantations tend to be at most risk. Um, right. But of course you have to have somewhere for um, them to originate it from. So particularly risky areas would be um, perhaps pines in the vicinity of um, a tree nursery or, you know, there's oh. got to be some way of them getting there in the first place. Right. Yeah, because not in this country at the moment, is it? No, it's not. No, right. it's like a lot of these diseases, one, isn't it? I suppose at the moment. Nursery. That's mm. right. 
Right. So I suppose the symptoms can look like that needle blight thing a bit as well, can't they? That red band needle blight? The, the feeding damage can, yes. Yes. Right. But of course you right. wouldn't see you wouldn't see the nests with that. No, of course. No, you'll just see like dizzy brown needles and things, right. Okay. Okay, thanks very much for those questions. That was great. So do we have any more questions? No. Okay, so thanks everyone. So particularly thanks to Liz. So that's very <laughs> kind of you. Uh, and we have another uh, webinar set, I think, in about a month's time, do we not? So yeah. it's on the 18th of April at 3.30 in the afternoon. Okay. okay. So thanks everyone. Thanks very much for your time. And uh, keep up the good surveillance work, folks. Thanks very much. Okay, Bye. Thanks very much.